there, there's other things along the way, but that's really it. So other things that we're doing um, to keep kind of catch and make sure that all this stuff is happening. Number one, I have a Monday morning managers meeting where I have everybody that's that what we call a junior trainer, somebody that does three sales and three recruits every month. They show up to my Monday morning managers meeting. And at that meeting, we're going over our calendar of events. I'm assigning, I don't like to run myself. I like to run them and make them get ready and they go study and learn to run the meetings. Does that make sense? And so I will constantly blindside people by going, hey, you're running Tuesday night's uh, financial meeting. You're running Thursday night's this, that, whatever. Does that make sense? And so I'm throwing stuff. That's how you build leaders. I throw them out to call people constantly. I don't care if they're ready. I don't care if the meeting sucks. It's not about that. It's about building leaders. Does that make sense? I want them to go study and get ready. And that's how we learn. I want them to go fail. I want them to fail forward. Does that make sense? Um, I, I want to I tell you guys something that, that I hardly ever tell anybody. Um, but when I first got into this business, as, as uh, Reese said, my dad, Monty Holm, right? started the company, one of the founders of the company. I started when I was 20 years old and I was newly married. I had just bought a house and I was a mechanic at U-Haul making two grand a month. And, and I, I, I had just started out and I was so excited. <laughs> I was so excited. I thought I was going to be rich, man, because I'm working, doing my, what my dad did now and whatever. And so I quit my job almost instantly thinking, you know, I'm going to be rich. And back in those days, you had to have all of your licenses. It took us on av average nine months to get somebody licensed and paid. And, and so, broke dude my first didn't make a dime they didn't make a dime and so my house fell into foreclosure i i had one morning where um there was a guy in my church that showed up on a sunday morning he owned a repo company his name was todd abelhaus and he showed up at my front doorstep and i had i had bought two months before that i had bought my wife a, a tahoe a chevy tahoe and again we had our first kid in our first house and we i already got the pink slip on my door for the my house was in foreclosure and and uh, this guy shows up at my door one Sunday morning before church and he goes, Hey, what's going on, man? And he knows who my dad is. Like we're a pretty small town and rich family. Right. And he goes, well, what's going on, dude? Why aren't you making your car payment? He goes, I have to take your car. I was like, Holy shit. <laughs> this is embarrassing. Right. And, and I, I closed the door and I was, I, I can't tell you how embarrassed I was. He, he, he did tell me, he goes, you have till Wednesday. You're costing me 500 because he gets paid 500 bucks to pick up the car and give it to the bank, right? He goes, you're costing me 500 bucks. If you haven't caught up on your payments by Wednesday, I'm coming to get your car. And I closed the door and I, I climbed into, I had a little coat closet right next to that door. And I climbed into that coat closet, closed the door in the dark, slumped on the floor and just cried. I was so embarrassed. And I have never felt so low and defeated until... I decided, I talked to my wife and she's like, listen, just go talk to your dad, right? And I've never, it's kind of a rich kid thing, right? I've never asked my dad for help out of pride, right? It's just kind of a thing. I, I always wanted to do it on my own and whatever. And I knew better than to go to my dad and ask for help without a plan. So I went to him and I, I had like this list of all the clients I've been working on and all this stuff and had it worked out to where I could pay him back in 30 days or 90 days, whatever. And, uh, and I needed like $3,200 to get by, to pay all the bills and get by. And, and you guys, I had less than two, I had $1.98 or something. I remember it was less than $2 in my checking account to my name, period, at two bucks. And so I went to him and I remember it like it was yesterday. I went down in his office and I, I scheduled a meeting with him. If you can imagine scheduling a meeting with your dad, that's how my whole childhood was. So I go schedule a meeting with my dad and I lay out this plan and I go, this is what I'm going to do. And this is how much I need. And this is how long it'll take me to get you back. And I'll pay, I'll pay interest, but I, I got to do something. I, I said, I just, I can't, my car's about to get repossessed. I'm going to lose my house. Um, and my water had gotten turned off the week before. I scrounged up enough to get it turned back on. Like it was bad, right? And he looked at me and he goes, okay, I think you can do it. And I go, yeah, I think I can too. This, I got a good thing going. I've got a lot of momentum. And he stopped and he paused and he looked at me again and he goes, I think you can do it. And I realized he was not going to help me. And I sat there like, holy crap, dude. I don't know what to do. And if you could imagine looking at your son who's broke, just barely got married, had his first kid and like broke and like cry. I'm embarrassed to say, but I was crying, right? Because I was embarrassed. And telling your son, I think you can do it, not helping him. Like for him, 3,200 bucks was a half an hour. You know what I mean? 
It, he he literally would have made that back in the next 45 minutes. Probably. It was not about the money at all. And so I walked out of that office feeling so defeated. And I wasn't mad because I, I didn't feel entitled to that in the first place. I felt stupid. Why did I think he would help me in the first place? I felt so stupid. And I walked out of there and realized I am alone. I've never felt so alone in my entire life that I am alone. And if something's going to happen, there is no option for me now other than to fight. That's it. That's it. I can't go get a loan. My credit's shot. I can't go get a job, right? The job's not going to pull me out of this. I have to just go fight. There's only one option. And so I did. And it took me about 45 days to go pull out of that. And the rest is history. And I thank God every day he did not give me 3200 bucks. I would still be asking for help today had he. And I think he knew that. And I think the strength of looking, because I know I know there's other family members of mine that have asked him for help and he's helped them, right? But I know what, I, I can't, I don't think I would have that strength if my kid was in front of me asking for help, you know, to not help him. But thank God he did. He let me go through my shit to give me strength to keep going. Does that make sense? And I want to challenge you guys, let people struggle. That's what makes them great. I can't, I don't, I, if I could stress anything, it's to put people in positions that polarize them and find out what they're capable of. Find out what they got. Are they going to fight and win or are they going to give up? Does that make sense? And then help encourage people, obviously, and motivate them and do what you can to help them along the way. But boy, that was a life-changing moment for me. When I realized there is no retreat, there is no option B. If I were to, if you guys were to think about today, I'm not saying you have to do this, but if your whole world fell apart and your only option was to make money with WFG, do you really think that you couldn't? Of course you could. The only reason you don't take it to the next level right now is because you don't have to. That's it. I want to write a book about this someday. It's going to be called The Have To Principle. Why do some people make 50 grand a month and others make five? The people that make five, the average income in Utah is $60,000 a year. It was a couple of years ago. It's probably a little more now. Average income. Why isn't it 90? Why isn't it a half a million? Why is it 60? Because that's what it costs to live here. That's what it costs to get by. That's what people have to make to get by. That makes sense? And if they lost their job, how long does it take the average person that makes five grand a month to find another job? to make the same money, about 90 days, about 60 days, excuse me, on average, studies show, right? They find another job to make the same amount of money. So if they can go from zero to five grand a month in 60 days, why couldn't they go from five to 10 in the next 60? That makes sense? What's interesting too, is you take the guy making 50 grand a month, he loses his job. How long does it take him to replace his income? Same 60 days. Isn't that weird? You'd think it would take longer because it's more money. No, they just work different. That's it. Does that make sense? And so my, my challenge to you guys is decide what you're going to do. Decide what you're going to do and get after it. And, and pretend, if you have to, that there is no retreat. What do you have to do? And to me, it's not about... I used to be very, very driven by money, meaning it's not by money. By, I was driven by the lack of money. <laughs> that I was, if I was poor, nothing motivated me more than being broke. I realized in that moment where my hustle really came from and it's being broke, right? And so I learned in the following years, this little game where if, if I have plenty of money in my bank, then I don't hustle very hard. I, I get comfortable, right? And comfort is the enemy of achievement, right? In fact, I bought my team all of all these hats. Can you guys see this? Comfort kills, stay driven. So we give away, give away these hats to the to everybody that wins the Tuesday night phone zone. Comfort kills. I believe that. And so I get comfortable if I have enough, too much money sitting around. So what I learned to do years ago, I drain my bank accounts at the end of every month and start with zero. I have to pay my bills with new money every single month. I don't have excess. I don't have reserves. I drain it, put it into my long-term savings accounts, and I refuse to touch that stuff. So I start from zero. And you guys, even today, 
there are times where I get, I get late payments on my cars and shit. And I don't care. Lots of my bills come out of the first of the month and I don't have enough to cover them sometimes. And it makes me driven. Does that make sense? I have to hustle. to do, And I'm telling you, people that become successful do weird things. And boy, it's weird when my bank calls and goes, hey, because they know what I make. They see my income. They're like, why, why have you not made your car payment? And I say, shut up and leave me alone. I'm not going to explain it to you. I'll pay it. Just leave me alone. And so I, I'm telling you that this little you and you're the only one that gets to determine what drives you. But you got to figure it out. You've got to figure it out. That's what drives me. Lack of having money keeps me driven. Does that make sense? And so I drain it every single month. There's little things like that that keep me driven. The other things that keep me driven are making sure I, I, I find with a new recruit something in them that challenges me. So I find out what their dreams are. So, for example, I had a new recruit yesterday and his goal is to retire his mom. She's sick. She got cancer and she still has to work a nine to five. And his, his whole goal in life is to retire his mom. So I personally take that on that I want to do that with him. Does that make sense? Or somebody's never made more than 10 grand in a month. I personally take that on that I want to go do that with them. Whatever their dream, I, so I find that out with them and then I will buddy up to them and make sure that that happens as best I can. But I make sure and set the expectation that I'm not going to do it for you. Here's what you have to do. This is your part. Five appointments a week, 20 phone calls, show up on Tuesday night, and one recruit a week. That's what you got to give me. Now, does it end up in one recruit a week exactly? No. Sometimes there's two in the next week, right? But it's an average of one a week. That's the expectation that we set on our team. And it, it all starts with you. And I will help as your team grows. You're not going to know what to do. I'll help. That's what I'm here for. You just do this part. That's it. You focus on your direct personal activity for the next 90 days. Rapid, relentless repetition with no excuses. I don't want to hear it. Does that make sense? Keep it to yourself. If you're struggling, I want to hear that. I just don't want to hear excuses. Make sense? So those are those are some of the things that we're doing. Other things are uh, real quickly. I know I'm running out of time. Um, I I decided when I came back that I want to run my comp my uh, agency like a business, not like a not like a a a, a fun thing to make some money. That I want to run. If if you had the opportunity, if you had unlimited resources, and you were going to go build a a WFG all over again, what would you do? How would you build it? What kind of things would you put it, have in place? And so here's what I determined: is I set some goals that I want a hundred percent recruit to license ratio, because that's where it all begins. If I recruit somebody, I need to get them licensed. Now, realistically, we can't get everybody licensed, right? But that's our goal is everybody get them licensed. And I don't have time to do that. So I hired a, a uh, licensing coordinator. So when somebody comes on my team, they meet with the licensing coordinator, she schedules their exam and lets them know when it is. They don't choose it. She lets them know, just like a big business. You wouldn't go to Merrill Lynch and they go, hey, when do you think you can take the exam? They go, no, your exam's on Wednesday. Get ready, pass or you're fired. Now we don't fire people, obviously, but I tell them, she tells them when their stuff is. And she orders their stuff for them. She gets everything to do with licensing, appointments, all of that kind of, all of the trainings, anti-money laundering, errors and omissions. She gives me a report at our Monday morning manager's meeting who has their errors and omissions so I know who's going to get terminated. We work hard enough to get them licensed. We don't want them terminated based on these stupid things, right? And so she makes sure all of the licensing things are in order. Anybody has any questions on that stuff? They go to her. That's her department, right? Then secondly, I have a policy coordinator. Any policy that gets written in my organization, not just my base shop, my entire organization, their, their job, there's two people now, their job is to make sure from application to issue, they take care of it. So my team, my agents, their only job is to feed the funnel. They get a recruit, I'm taking the care of the recruit for now. I'm going to teach them how to do that later. But for now, I'm taking care of that. And by taking care of that, I don't personally do that a lot of times. That's the policy coordinator, right? Or they plug into the trainings, but I'm helping with that. Make sense? They don't know how to lead people. <laughs> Just give me the people. I'll take care of it. Treat me like I'm the head of your sales organization. You give me the people and I'll deal with it, right? You give me the, the, the policies. Bring in the policies and sell. make the sale. And I'll show you how to do that, right? But I don't want, I, my guys don't worry about following up on policies. 
That stuff that bogs them down. Here's the deal. I look at my business like a pipe. The stuff that goes in this end, it comes out this end. And what most people do is they'll feed something in this end and then they follow it and watch it and make sure everything happens until it plops out a little bit of cash. And then they go back and feed it a little more. And then they watch it, pops out some cash and they feed it a little more, right? Anybody feel that way? Where it's like every once in a while you get some commissions. I want my business gushing money. Absolutely just gushing money to where I couldn't cap it off if I tried. And so, and I want other, it, in order for mine to do that, I got to teach other people how to do that. So all I let them focus on is the front of their business. They don't focus on all the stuff that goes on in the pipeline. My staff takes care of that. Does that make sense? So I'm running it like a comp, like a big company. They focus on feeding the funnel. And, and, and I don't care what those things are. The concept is run it like it's a big business. If you're running your small business like a small business, it never it will it doesn't have a chance to become a big business. It doesn't even have a chance. But if you run your small business like it's a big business, now it can. That makes sense. Whether it will or not is up to you. But that's what I determine is I don't care what it costs me. And I'm not telling you guys to go spend money on stuff that's unnecessary. In fact, in the very beginning, my licensing coordinator and policy coordinator and bay, uh, my uh, bay shop coordinator, all three the same person. That makes sense? It's now gotten to the point where we have to have multiple staff members and, and we're running our own big events now and lots of different things going on. But I wanted to run it like a big organization, right? If you took over Rajah's team today, what would you do? What would you put in place to manage a team like that? That's how I was thinking. That's how I would challenge you to think, is what would you have in place and get to the point where, and here's the other reason I wasn't afraid of that, because I'm motivated by what? Lack of money, right? And so if I get some staff in place that cost me some money, I now have to make more money because that's the one thing I can't get behind on is paying my staff, right? I'm all, sorry, guys. <laughs> you know what I make. You see it, but I can't pay you because I haven't made it this month. I can't do that, right? So we have to make sure that that stuff is in place for the staff. Um, other things that we're doing, uh, we, we and you guys were doing some of this, actually. I'm not even going to cover it. Um, Tuesday night phone zone, pre-planning each week. Knowing the agenda, we talked about that. The SMD isn't the end big goal. Having a business set out to do something big and do it, get after it in a big, big way. Um, the team culture. And then uh, I guess the the last thing that I would cover, and then I want to show you guys one little spreadsheet that I go over with my team so that they can understand. I think accomplishing anything begins with seeing it first and understanding the pieces of it. Does that make sense? It's a lot like building a house. It'd be pretty ridiculous to think you'd even begin building your dream home without a very thought out and detailed blueprint that you've seen meticulously gone over, envisioned walking down the hallways. Where does everything go? Where do you want the light switches? It, it, think how ridiculous this is for a second. That me and Reese are like, hey, we got some ground. You go get the concrete, I'll get the lumber. Let's just start building a house. How far would we get? And yet that's what most people do with their business. They're like, I know I need some recruits, so let's get some. They don't know what that means. They don't know the long term, what, what exactly. So I, I'm a firm believer in blueprinting things out and showing people exactly what that, what that looks like, right? And so my beginning conversation is we need 10 licenses. We need one person with five of them. Blueprint, makes sense? So you give me one a week, I'm going to help make sure everything else happens. So if we need 10, we got 12 weeks to do this and get a bunch of directs in that time. Does that make sense? Really, really simple. Um. The, uh, the other thing that I tell people, and I think this is a game changer for our team, uh, that has been one of, the, one of the downfalls I see from different teams is we're constantly teaching people to take ownership or new people, take ownership and be a leader. leader, And that's good, obviously, right? That we want them to go run their own meetings and do this stuff. Here's the challenge as I see it sometimes. And that's obviously a good thing. And we do want that. However, while you're a trainee, if you're new, use that to your advantage. If you don't, if you don't really have a lot of confidence in what you're doing yet, then you should still be a trainee and use your leader. And what that looks like, here's here's what I teach my guys, is I don't want if it, let me speak to you. If you're my trainee, here's what I'm telling you. I don't want you going out to your friends and family and telling them, hey, I started a financial services company and we're going to take it all the way to the top. Come follow me. They're like, bro, I saw you last week at U-Haul. I'm not following you anywhere. Like, that sounds great. And, but what are they really going to say? They're not going to tell me that. They're going to go, that sounds awesome, man. Let me know how it goes. Let's keep in touch. Anybody feel that from anybody? 
and they're, they're positive and encouraging, but you can't seem to get them over the edge to come on board with you. That's because you're getting them to follow you. Don't get them to follow you. Get them to follow Reese. Get them in front of Reese. Get them in front of leaders. Get them in front of people that they don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be an SMD even. Just somebody that they don't know. That's it. Does that make sense? So your own warm market, get out of your own way. And it has nothing to do with the fact that you're not a fantastic person or you have trust and credibility in the, or, or trust in the relationship. You just don't have credibility yet. And don't be offended by that. Use it to your advantage. So by, by using it to your advantage, what I mean is as a trainee, learn to say, I don't know, but I can get the answer. You guys got to understand when we're dealing with people's money and their livelihood and they're changing careers, potentially they're both bullshit meters on high alert that makes sense you're dealing with people's money their bullshit detector is on high alert and they can see right through bullshit so don't bullshit them be vulnerable and honest if you don't know something say i don't know but i can get you the answer and so what that sounds like this is what we teach our team constantly it's like fishing as you're prospecting it's like fishing you got your bobber out there and and people asking questions is that that's a fish on the hook you know they're interested because they're asking questions answering those questions is letting them off the hook why would you take the hook out of a fish's mouth when it's clear away from the boat still get the fish in the boat where you take you can manage it and take the hook out while it's managed what i mean by that is don't and if you're new don't answer people's questions until that fish is in the boat until that person is in front of a leader that can properly answer those questions we call also call that the takeaway. And so we don't have our guys answer questions. That's a fantastic question. In fact, I'd love to see how Mike answers that. Let's set up a meeting with Mike. That makes sense? If you're still in training, use that to your advantage. Tell people you don't know and get a meeting set up with a leader. You use it constantly where somebody that can that can take that that uh, fish out of the hook's mouth or the uh, hook out of the fish's mouth. Does that make sense? And so uh, somebody that knows how to answer those things. And by the way, even if it's somebody that doesn't really know how to answer those things, as long as it's not you, it's somebody that they don't know. Take all of that weight off of your trainee's shoulders and put it where it belongs on a trainer. That you're not, if you're a trainee, it's not your job to go lead a team. It's not your job to go find clients and do financial plans and all of those things. It's your job to get them in the doors. Does that make sense? And get them in front of a leader. And then you learn to, and by the way, I think a lot of times we're having trainees take too little time of trainee being a trainee. They want to get off on their own. And, and, and I encourage that for sure. But I would challenge you guys, if you're struggling even a little bit, hit the reset button and get, become a trainee again for a minute. Get back with the leadership. Forget about everything you know and get back in front of a trainer and, and do those different things. Okay. Um, so 12 weeks, five appointments a week, one direct a week. We talked about that. Um, and make sure everyone knows the goal and knows their role within it and that they follow your example. You can't go expect people to do something you're not doing. I had a meeting with one of my SMDs yesterday and uh, she's like, I can't, I'm struggling so bad. It seems like everybody's quitting and blah, 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 blah. And, and had very little recruiting last month, very little points in production last month. And so I went into last month's production and recruiting and the previous month on her personal recruiting and production. First thing I do every time. Guess what her personal recruits were over the last 30, 45 days? Zero. So no wonder her team's not doing anything. You have to do it first. You have to. You can't sit there, sit around and browbeat everybody and you're like, hey, get after it, man. Our base shop's struggling. You have to just do it. And then lead by example. Does that make sense? Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share my screen with you guys real quick. And I'm going to go over this out to everybody if you guys want it. Um, actually, it'll be probably a little bit different because you guys are in Canada, but you guys can adjust the numbers. It's a spreadsheet that I go over with my team. Oh, let me uh, figure out how to share this. I think I'm the host, aren't I? Yeah. Okay, cool. Here we go. So I built this. Um, and the first thing that I go over with everybody is the compensation schedule. I teach them exactly how it works. Now, looking at this, it's complicated, right? This is going to overwhelm just about anybody. It's going to feel like drinking out of a fire hose. However, you got, you've got to know how we get paid to understand how this thing works. So this isn't the important part. This is just so that they have a reference to understand everything. This has the different pay levels in it. WFG put something like this out, but again, I'll, I'll send it to you if you guys want this. Um, 
but I can show them exactly where 100% of every penny from every sale goes to every level, every generation, right? Then I give them a sales calculator where they can come in here and possibilitize and they can say, if I'm a training agent, um, oh, that, yeah, if I'm a agent and this is a not with anybody, this is what I'll make on an average case of 4,000 points. And you, you guys know, because I always wanted something that teaches people, we get paid on excess premium. What does that look like? What are renewal? How much do we actually make on renewals? So that I can possibilitize for the long run. If, if I'm making, you know, if I net as a training agent, I'm netting uh, $89 on, re on renewals each year, right? How many of those do I got to do to get $1,000 a month coming in in the long run? I want them to know this stuff. You with me? And so, or if I'm a senior marketing director, because that's our primary focus, um, and I'm going to be splitting sales most of the time with uh, agents, let's say, and they are in my downline, that gives me the override. I'm going to make in total about $4,600 in the life of an IUL contract. After renewals, after everything's said and done, my renewals are going to be about $233 on a $4,000 case, $233 a year on this one. That makes sense? I want them to know the ins and outs. We deep dive training on the contracts so that they understand and know how money's made here. If I will make a term, sell a term policy, 125 bucks a month. This is what it would be. These different things, annuity, I, you know, $250,000 on an annuity. This is what we would make on a split sale. I want them to know the ins and outs on these different things. Here's what this does is it teaches people that I need to get to SMD because this is where the maximum spread is on my base shop. So I can make more money, get them excited, right? It develops the have to in their mind. I have to get there to make this happen. The last thing real quickly, um, Reset asked me, how did you do 575,000 in your first year? Here it is. That it, we do an average points of about 4,800 points in our base shop, average sale. And so if I have, and I do personally about eight sales a month in my base shop, right? And so average 4,800 points, eight sales a month. I do about 40,000 points a month personally right now. And like I said, I'm in the hunt, in the fight like a madman every single day. And then if I have um, if I have three junior, we call them junior trainers. This is how I have my base shop view. Junior trainer is nothing more than somebody that can sell, make three sales and three recruits in a month, right? Consistently every month, we call them a junior trainer. If I have three junior trainers that are making three sales a month about, about 16 sales a month, 15 right there. So my bottom line is it's 23 sales in a month in my base shop generates 110,000. That's 40,000 plus the bonus is 44,000 a month. It's about 600 grand a year with my one SMD that we've built so far. If we understand the math, I basically have to go build, uh, uh, what did I say? Six junior trainers. That's 18 sales a month. Six junior trainers doing three sales is 18 sales a month. That's it. I don't have to have a team of 10,000 people. Now, to have to build three, or excuse me, to build six junior trainers, I've got to have about 20 people coming in every month. A recruiting, a base shop of about 20 recruits a month. That makes sense? And so that's that's what we have to do. That's what we're getting done. It's not that big of a deal. And tracking, and I guess the last thing I'll, and again, I'll share this with you guys if you want this, but the point isn't this. It's helping people understand clearly where their money comes from, how this works, what the goal is, and the blueprint to make it happen, just like if you were going to go build a, your dream home. That makes sense? It's it's not really about the spreadsheet. It's about under, and you guys ought to understand exactly what you're after and how everything works. Um, and it it is a lot. No question. But we get paid a lot. <laughs> so it's worth understanding all that stuff, isn't it? And so you guys, I, there's no doubt in my mind, we're 575 right now. We've got until July, until convention to get up over in a million. And we've already got it in the pipe. We've got about $9 million in rollovers right now. You wouldn't believe what happens when you get after it. There, there, there is a magic that happens. This is what I'll say to you guys in closing. There is a magic magnetism that happens when you go all out and you sell all out. And, and I know... I'll, I'd be willing to bet every ball has had that moment where they've gotten really fired up after a big event. And it seems like people come out of the woodworks and they call you, people you talked to months ago. 
It's like they could feel it, right? They're like, man, I, I've been thinking about you. I wanted to call you. I wanted to talk to you. Some of you guys are nodding your heads. You know exactly what I'm talking about. When your energy level goes high, it's like people can feel it and they come out of the woodworks, right? So get it there and keep it there. How do you do that? You set some big goals and get after it. You live about it. You do everything you can, constantly talk about it, constantly live it. And you become a magnet that attracts people to your business. It is so much easier to run a big base shop than it is a small base shop. So much easier. It's so much easier to recruit people when you're after it, when you have an example to show people. When you when you go, you, you know how easy it is for me to recruit people right now when I've made over half a million in my first six, nine months? So much easier. Does that make sense? Go after it. It gets easier and easier and easier. It's really only the first, hard for how long? The first... 90 days. That's it. You have to go after it. Go all in for the first 90 days. And know that you're in a war against your subconscious. And every time shit gets in your way and you want to quit and you want to give up, that's not real. That's not you. That's your subconscious. And you tell it to go to hell and you keep fighting. Your subconscious is a liar, man. And it will try to keep... It's, it's not like it tries to keep you from being successful. It doesn't care either way. It just doesn't like change. And it takes 90 days to make that lasting change. And then it will care to keep you successful. That makes sense? Once you've made that change, you can't go back. So it's, it's worth fighting like hell to make that change. You ever notice when somebody's income goes up, it never really goes back down, even if they change jobs, even if they change careers. It never really goes back down because they changed. Does that make sense? Are you ready to change? And if you're not, that's okay. Keep plugging in, keep going along, keep being, you know, if you're a part-time person, that's fantastic. If you're not ready for it, we love you. You belong here. Don't beat yourself up over it. But if you're ready, I challenge you to pull that trigger and go all in. Make a 90-day madman run and you won't regret it. And in fact, if you do, I can promise you right now, I'll make each and every one of you a $10,000 bet right now that if you'll go all in for the next 90 days, we see each other in five years. I can promise you, you will be one of two people. You'll either be able to say that, I, I don't know why my Zoom does that, does these celebrations. Either I'm glad I did or I wish I would have. You will not be indifferent if you go after it. I promise you, you will not regret it. You will not be indifferent if you go after it. Make sense? So you guys, I appreciate you having me on. Um, it's a it's a pleasure. I look very much forward to you guys' success and spending time with you guys in Hawaii and convention and all the different things we get an opportunity to do and actually getting to know a bunch of you guys. So thank you so much. Is there anything else, Reese? No, that was that was awesome. I'm gonna start the mapping process for all of us to come come into your base shop. Just <laughs> you don't need to do that. I'll help you anytime. No, I appreciate yeah. it, man. Let's let's uh let's give a round of applause for for Mike Holm. Thank you so much. That Thank was, uh, that was gold. I mean, I definitely wanted to, you know, respect you and, and, you know, go through some takeaways while you're still here. I mean, I got I yeah. had three pages of notes, so it'll take me 15 minutes just to go through them. But I think, you know, one of my biggest takeaways was just how simple it is. Right. And, and I mean, for instance, I mean, I got a bunch of people on my team here. We do a phone zone, mm -hmm. right? I haven't set the standard that like you need to be at the phone zone, but I mean, it's usually just me and Jason. Sometimes a couple couple other people are there. Sometimes they're not. But it's like me and Jason. Today, Zach popped on. You know, he's running his provincials this week. And so, you know, to our phone zones, we're going to be doing that. We're going to be implementing that into our team. Um, you know, we're going to be driving them. We're going to be setting the standard of the five appointments and one recruit a week. And, uh, and you know, taking control of everything from there. And And I mean, although our licensing is a little bit you know, slower up in Canada, also depending on the provinces. I mean, there's provinces it can take three, four months and there's states where it can be done in a weekend. Um, you know, I still think that SMD is, is actually exactly like you're saying, it's not big. We just make it big. And then it's kind of like the end of the journey, right. Yeah. With some extra bonus pools afterwards. SMD yeah. is, you know, you're in your parents' basement until you're in SMD. You have now officially graduated high school and moved out when you hit SMD. Um, you know, the base shop is basically boot camp, um, you know, to go to war. So 
I love everything that you're saying, man. And, and I mean, there's so much good stuff there. I love the R3NE, you know, the, the rapid relentless repetition with no excuses. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, that was, that was all really good. I got, I got tons of notes. Does any, any leaders on the call, does anybody here have anything they want to, you know, share that were big takeaways for, um, for Mike before he pops off and, and goes and hangs out with his family? Angela is always good for it. All right, Angela, pop on, pop on here. Can't hear, can't wait to hear what your takeaway. Perfect. Uh, perfect. Well, first of all, of course, thank you, Reese, for letting us be on, and thank you, Mike, for the great stuff. So my biggest takeaways was just like kind of what Reese went through, but like just a conversation of like let's get to EVC, and I'm like I don't think I've ever talked to my team about getting to EVC. And so, I mean, I've talked about it, but not like you do. And I just think that's like, hey, we're going to get to SMB and you're going to build nine SMBs and you're going to be EVC. And just talking the bigger language and having higher standards, keeping your, you know, building a new team whenever things aren't. And then, you know, having having that, those are two of my biggest things. It's just like, and we've done that in our team, so I've seen it happen. Um, but those are two of my biggest takeaways is just talking way bigger and setting higher standards and 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 setting it for myself, first of all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and to clarify, you guys, the reason we talk about EVC in our team is because it, it, obviously, first of all, SMD is just a stepping stone, right? We know that. But you can't let your asset, you can't retire at SMD. There's standards of excellence. You can get AVP and all of your overrides can get cut in half. Do you guys know that? So you can't stop there. It's only at EVC that there's no more base shop standards of excellence and you can actually step back and live the dream. So that's why we talk about that. That, that, that is the end goal. If you want to have one, you can go well beyond that, but you can't stop till you get there. Mm -hmm. Right. Other, otherwise, you're going to be in this, this cycle of running a base shop forever. Please Shh. Oh, be quiet. <laughs> yeah, perfect. All right. I love that. And so true. Sorry, I was just trying to mute the person there. So I had like an awkward introduction, introduction, yes, but, um, you know, definitely, definitely so true. Can't, can't stop there. Um, Jason, you got, you had a takeaway brother. Yeah, I just, I really loved nothing bad will happen when you go in all in. Um, you know, a lot of us have had, you know, that, that fear of going all in and really, you know, it's it's easy when you when you hear it from somebody else. Nothing bad will happen. What what's going to happen? We're just going to get better. We're just yeah. going to improve. You know, like you said, it takes losing to win. Um, that was you know, I've got a whole bunch of takeaways. I love rapid relent relentless repetitions with no excuses. Anybody that's playing at a high level anywhere, whether it's athletes, musicians, somebody in this business, sales, whatever that is probably the number one thing that they can take away. Thank you very much for this, Michael. I really appreciate your time. You're very welcome. Yeah, I love it. Thanks so much again, Mike. And, and, you know, if I can plug the events again, like I, you guys would not have heard this message if I didn't spend money I didn't have last year and go to Vegas. And if I had gone to bed early, I wouldn't have met Mike at the lobby bar. Right. So you know, you guys have to get in these environments where the champions are so you can build these relationships. And secondly, you know, adopt their mindset. So, you know, from the bottom of my heart, Mike, if I can ever repay you in any way, you know, let me know. I'm super grateful that, you know, you're able to pop on here with us tonight because, you know, you're, you guys are obviously on fire and you just spent an hour and, you know, almost an hour and a half with us and you definitely didn't have to. So I appreciate that. Um, you know, let's give up a round of applause for Mike one more time. Thank you so much, brother. Thank you, guys. And uh, everyone, before.